All right, so welcome to episode 11 of Growing Down Podcast. And today we are joined by Bruce Alderman. Welcome to the show, Bruce. Good to have you. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to be here with all of you. Fantastic. And uh, Bruce is a professor over at JFK University. Uh, many integralists know of him or know him already. You hosted the Integral Post Metaphysical Forum, a number of different forums over the years. Uh, you've been published in many journals. Um, and uh, you're definitely one of the more interesting integral academics I've come across over the years. Um, and we're really delighted to have you on the show. We have a lot of questions for you and uh, a lot of interesting directions. And to start off, I'm gonna pass the microphone over to Matt and Matt's uh, got a few things queued up to begin with, so. All right, thanks. So um, Bruce, one of the questions I had for you, um, I read some of your metaphysics papers and admittedly a lot of it was over my head. So I'm hoping to, by the end of this uh, conversation to get a better grasp on maybe how metaphysics applies in our world and uh, more specifically to politics. And so um, the last episode, we kind of kicked around this idea that Zach Stein had in his paper on metapolitics. And I'd like to just um, share that again for our listeners who maybe didn't listen last time. Um, and what he says is, quote, what this means is that when I engage metapolitics and in so doing engage metaphysics, I am actually on a quest for the means to stop, stop going meta. A metaphysically grounded construction of a coherent meta framework is exactly the way to stop the infinite regress of going meta that threatens the very future of humanity. This is a warning in future posts I will start to go metaphysical in my discussions of human nature, existential risk, and planetary scale computation and measurement infrastructures. But I am going metaphysical because it is the only way to stop going meta. You may say metaphysics, I can't believe it's not meta, and yet it is exactly metaphysics that brings us back to earth. And so I know I kicked this idea to you to just uh, kind of prepare you for maybe where we would like to go with it, but did you have any thoughts on maybe why metaphysics is the thing that brings us back to earth? Or do you agree with it? I do, actually, as you were talking about that and talking about the distinction or talking about going meta and metaphysics, I was already anticipating saying, I think going metaphysical is not necessarily tied to going meta and that actually metaphysics can be grounding and orienting. And I'm saying this as a person who's been running for years a forum on post metaphysics. But through that inquiry where I first maybe naively, in fact, definitely naively tried to follow uh, Wilbur's initial writings on that and thinking that we can move into a space that is uh, somehow beyond metaphysics. Uh, through that inquiry, I, I basically came to find that we really can't get away from metaphysics. And I've reframed post-metaphysics for myself as a way of, you could say, recognizing the, the gesture that metaphysical inquiry is and sustaining a willingness to shift between metaphysical modes uh, recognizing that each one may emphasize or highlight different aspects of being and therefore have consequences in terms of perception and inaction. Um, and so it's, to me now, post-metaphysics is more like meta-metaphysics. And that might seem like it's bumping up against Zach's warning um, about going meta too often. And I actually agree with that. We, we want to be careful about that. We don't want to always just jump out of the context and try to gain a one up. That, that's a thing that you see happening all the time in integral discourse. Somebody's talking about somebody, some topic of, of choice or some, some concern. And, and the immediate thing is to reframe it in terms of your, your pet meta theory or, or your higher perspective. And it, it can be stifling to meeting each other and, and to really engaging. Um, but I uh, agree generally with the, you know, speculative realists, um, object-oriented ontologists, that uh, metaphysics is relevant. It's an important um, inquiry that, that helps us uh, ground ourselves in the world, um, orient ourselves politically. The kind of metaphysics we hold has 
ecological and spiritual and uh, social consequences. Um, so yeah, that's just an initial remark, but we can go deeper on that. Yeah, um, I guess my question kind of off the bat is um, not necessarily how we do that, but um, I mean, using kind of the integral framework, um, how, how, how would that work in, in having people sort of more grounded and down to earth and be able to respond? Because I know in reading some of your papers, uh, or it, it talked about a, so kind of a good metaphysical framework should get you involved in doing things. I know that's a bad summary, but um, can you can you kind of talk about how a good metaphysical framework can help help us do that? Um, I think you know one thing that's coming to mind is something that you know Levi Bryant often emphasizes, and that you know there have been consequences after the postmodern turn to tending towards the reduction of everything to language and linguistic signifier and um, social construct. And I think that's a, you know, I don't mean to short sell postmodernism with that. There's a lot of complexity and richness in postmodernism, but there has been a move towards, uh, you could say epistemology and, and uh, framing things in terms of construction and uh, Bhaskar or uh, Bryant both have recognized that um, when you do that, ultimately you start bracketing out <laughs> the real world from your decisions and from recognizing basically uh, how systems and networks and objects and laws and all kinds of things are, you know, entangled with, with whatever we experience in the world. And uh, if you take certain epistemologically heavy approaches that try to bracket out any reflection on on ontology. Usually ontology goes underground and it's one that doesn't really acknowledge, I think, the the weight and the importance of the ordinary objects of the world. I, in uh, David Abram, he kind of talks about this. A, I relate some of what David Abram does to the discussion of Graham Harmon of overmining and undermining, um, where by overmining or undermining, we're always retreating either up to some higher principle or to some subterranean cause for things, but we then just kind of forget about the ordinary world of ordinary objects and animals and peoples and, you know, trees and things like that. And so David Abram, with his uh, more poetic, mythopoetic kinds of reflections and phenomenological reflections, really invites us again and again back into dialogue with the presence of things in the world and that that kind of relationality needs to ground our reflections on whatever we are are getting up to in the world. Um, if we just fly off to economic concerns without recognition of, of the material grounding of those things, for instance, that, that gets us astray pretty fast. I wanted to do a deep dive here into some really, really geeky, nerdy philosophical territory. So from what I've observed, two of the metaphysical schemes or thought systems that are most prevalent and sexiest at this time, or maybe at least most consonant with some integral concepts are Whiteheadian process metaphysics and also object-oriented ontology. And I've recently been studying Harmon and also, um, who was, what was the hype? Uh, Timothy Morton and, and his work. And some, sometimes I find those two schemas are kind of at odds with each other. So I'm, I'm curious, what are some of the similarities between process metaphysics and object-oriented ontology? What are some of the differences and how can those two paradigms be commensurated with each other? That is a deep one and a difficult one. <laughs> um, I think Levi Bryant is a, a good person to approach um, for that. And I, I think some aspects of, of Morton also, um, but Levi Bryant really consciously tries to integrate a Whiteheadian approach and an object-oriented approach. And in a way it's similar actually to Wilbur's um, distinctions between holons and processes. And for him, a holon is a process. And whenever you find a process, you typically find either a holon or a relationship among holons, right? Uh, you know, a social holon. So um, in that regard, I, I think, you know, there, there are different ways of, of looking into, you know, phenomena um, and, and highlighting either in my own you know, approach where I'm, I'm trying to look at the multiple grammatical lenses, either looking at it nounally or looking at it 
um, verbally, but both bring you into certain kinds of relationships with, um, with objects or, or with, with processes, with reality. Yeah, I, I would like to maybe say, you know, if I'm going off on a tangent, you can, you know, maybe redirect me here. But for me, what I've been trying to do in my work with, uh, you know, grammar, grammar philosophy or, you know, grammar theology and grammar philosophy or integral grammatology uh, is to really look at the deep metaphysical presuppositions that underlie most um, worldviews. This is what Benita Roy calls the view, right? And some, if you've read my paper, you know I've, I've highlighted that. But typically, the, the pronounal perspectives, the I, the we, the it, the its, you know, those can give you a perspective on something, but there's typically an underlying metaphysic there that's not disclosed by taking um, just by, by focusing on those epistemological lenses. Benita Roy has been trying to look at the difference, you know, between what she's attempting and what Wilbur's attempting, and she sees more of a structural, more of a object-related, you know, or oriented uh, kind of approach in, in Wilbur's work, and she's more interested in uh, a processual approach, something that seems, you know, or sees things in terms of dynamic relations. Uh, and and you know relational flows and and, and emergence. Um, I think Wilbur would want to acknowledge that. So it's really just a difference in emphasis. But to me, looking at things you know from the grammatical, the integral grammatological lens, uh, then you can begin to see what are the emphases in each of these different approaches, and and then what are the consequences of those approaches, and what I call ontochoreography is making a practice of moving through those different ways of enacting the world and exploring what are the consequences of those things, not just to have a big meta view, but to really feel into um, how are we impacting the world when we live here and what are we neglecting to see and what is disclosed if we cycle you know, kaleidoscopically um, through these different lenses or perspectives and hopefully yield, you know, the ontological multiplicity and complexity of any situation. Uh, so I, I know I veered away from uh, the whitehead and object-oriented thing a little bit, but to me, whitehead and object-oriented, you know, those whitehead would be more um, verbal and prepositional and object-oriented would actually be um, nounal, but also prepositional, because it's inviting you into the object-oriented approach, invites you into always seeing a sacred, or not a sacred, but an ontological excess, something that pulls you in <laughs> um, to recognize a hidden depth of things all the time. I was going to say, um, yeah, this, this is a very, this may sound like a tangent, we're, we're going with this conversation, but I think I'd like to flip that over and explore First of all, if you could give a, a good definition of integral grammatology, and then secondly, um, are there certain uh, certain grammatological emphases that our particular culture, let's say, you know, uh, Mark Fisher calls it capitalist realism, et cetera, there's certain kind of underlying grammars and structures and relations to the world that are exacerbating the crisis that we're in, right? The meta crisis that we're in. Um, or to kind of frame it another way, I've been looking at Nora Bateson's work recently and uh, Gregory Bateson as well. And, you know, Bateson, Gregory Bateson has that line about, you know, we don't see the world as it is, right? We, we don't actually see it and therefore we kind of break it when we engage with it. So what are, what are the, some of those gaps and the ways in which we're not seeing the world, right? We're not engaging the world in that certain way. Um, and then thirdly, just as a footnote to what you just said, it's very interesting um, that you're bringing up the, the kaleidoscopic approach, because it seems like folks like Gepser or even McLuhan were talking about, you know, with Gepser, it's this aperspectival approach. And with McLuhan, he's saying we need, and he's draw drawing this from uh, James Joyce, a, a kaleidoscope approach to all the different expressions of human consciousness, right? All kind of coming forward. So I'm just seeing some implicit connections there. That's just a footnote, geeking out with you, but. Cool, yeah. Uh, integral grammatology is something that actually grew out of 
inquiries on the integral post metaphysical spirituality thread uh, or forum and, and threads on that forum. We were exploring object oriented ontology as a new sexy emerging you know, philosophy, one that was challenging initially, it looked like our post metaphysical emphasis and really engaging with what they were doing helped me really to own <laughs> uh, working with metaphysics in a new way. But one of the things that I noticed was a lot of the debates going on among different speculative realists tended to fall along these different lines of people wanting to pro emphasize um, or, you know, uh, pronounce the importance of objects and things or processes and flows. And I, you know, they themselves named those things as, you know, noun orientations or, or verb orientations. And of course, in an integral forum, I was thinking about the integral tendency always to frame things from a, you know, a, a uh, pronounal orientation from the I and the we and the it and the its. And so just looking at those three things, I thought, actually, there's probably a lot here if I started digging. Could I find approaches that really were adjectival? Um, could I find approaches that were prepositional? And just a short time of digging, I began to find a lot. Um, and it, I realized that there are different metaphysical systems out there that I don't think any of them rely exclusively on any one of those different kinds of approaches. I mean, every language contains most of those elements in some form, but different metaphysical systems, political and social and spiritual worldviews, they, they tend to have different emphases, different things that come forward and, and receive the most attention or are actually maybe the most forward implicitly in terms of how things are framed. And so I just started thinking, we need to develop a way of, of looking at those things in depth and being able to uh, recognize and interrelate and interface with um, different types of metaphysical systems. And a post-metaphysical approach is a meta-metaphysical approach, meaning that you're able to actually move in and out of and adopt different uh, prepositional or nounal or verbal approaches as the situation might merit. And so, Joel Morrison calls that taking the a-categorical imperative. And basically by that, he means that you, it, I, I relate it to Gebser's a-perspectivity in terms of being able to uh, recognize, uh, you know, multiplicity of, 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 you know, possible ontological expressions <laughs> um, and, and modes of interface, right? And so, yeah, that's, that's where the project started really is, is just me digging into that and then finding out what kinds of, of philosophies are circulating around one or the others uh, of these you know, emphases. And what came forward for me of particular interest was that it's only really recently that we're finding more emphasis on prepositions. And prepositions actually are in some ways, I think, subtler than, than verbs or processes. They are the prepositioning vector space of any process or of, of any ontological manifestation. You can see in Latour, in um, Sloterdijk, uh, in Michel Serre, um, in Jean-Luc Nancy, in integral theory, if you look at the, the four quadrants and how they cohere, uh, there, there are many, many different examples where actually either explicitly or implicitly, there's this emphasis on relationship and modes of relationship as very important to meaning making and understanding any, any given situation or you know, ontological situation. Um, and you know, that's one of the things that systems thinking teaches us, for instance, is you know, when we're observing a system, the system involves our mode of relationship to it. And one of the things that a systems thinker has to do is to be able to shift <laughs> um, the way that they're relating to the system in order to disclose new aspects of the system. And to me, that's different than just the prepositional, I mean, I'm sorry, the pronounal um, approach of just shifting the epistemological lens. It, to me, it, it's, it's deeper than that. It's a deeper kind of shift than just changing the external perspective. And, and so 
I don't know, it's been a long time since I've written or thought about these things, so I'm hoping that it's coming out intelligibly and, and coherently enough. But um, in terms of like what's going on now, I see this emergence of a concern with prepositions as a concern to address some of the deeply entrenched problems that have accompanied various forms of metaphysics that we've been subject to for a while. One where it's very much a, an empirical approach, but one that, that privileges um, objects and things and wants to bracket out qualities <laughs> um, where, where things are, are reduced to kind of their gross manifestations treating things as objects and, you know, bodies as machines and things like that. So we have a, a number of, you know, metaphysical approaches that are doing that now. And then on the other side, some of the process-oriented ones often seem to sacrifice the individual, the object, in, in favor of the, the working out of the process that has a desired end, but there's, there's slighter attention to the integrity of any objects <laughs> within the system that you're trying to manipulate, you know, and so there can be a lot of, you know, I think profound personal, political, moral consequences to that. I'm seeing in this move towards a concern with prepositions is a desire to step out of either one of those modes of either thinking of things as concretely fixed objects or um, as, you know, as processes in which objects become you know, just subordinate pawns to be moved around in terms of, you know, the achievement of the various ends of, of whatever you're trying to, to, to do, um, or, you know, in terms of the social constructionist perspectives, looking at things as perspectives and relations without any kind of grounding there. And so, to me, I see in the prepositional approach, one that is calling us in a deep way into embodied relationships with the teeming flux of, of forms and beings at, you know, surrounding us, you know, we're putting us in the thick midst of relation and learning to navigate that in a new way. And I think Michel Serre, the way he refl reflects on the earth and our relationship and our contracts with the earth is, you know, or, or Donna Haraway when she's, you know, talking about, you know, um, the entangled threads of things, both of them are asking us to kind of think in the thick midst of things in a way that can hold both process and thinghood without kind of reduction in either direction in a way that has been negatively impactful socially so far. Yes, I think that that actually does give quite a bit of emphasis on the implications of our metaphysics for how we treat the world and how we perceive the world, right? And there's this word floating around. I don't know if you want to comment on it at all, but uh, sense making. I don't know if you feel that's too vague of a word or if it's actually a helpful word for this kind of question because there are many different communities. They're called sense-making communities. Um, uh, the Emergencia, which our friend Brent Cooper has been popularizing, that are all kind of interested in, I think, implicitly in the kinds of questions you're exploring here, um, maybe not as explicitly as you're drawing out here and clarifying, which is actually very helpful. Um, but maybe you want to comment on that and then my only other point is just to say that there's, it's interesting that you're mentioning this because I'm thinking about um, Gepser writing about this in 1936, where he's talking about this change in language in the German language and how um, it's not so much about the nouns, but the relationship between the nouns that is becoming important in this new German poetry that he was studying. So it's so interesting, you know, that, that he was writing about this, you know, over a century ago or near a century ago now. Um, and you brought up somebody in the integral community mentions a categorical, which is interesting. Um, Gepser mentions that as well. And I wonder if you have any comments on his notion of cystasis, where he seems to be without being, I think, not, without being as familiar or even contemporary enough with the various philosophical debates and traditions in our context, basically argues for, hey, we need objects and objects also have temporics. So there's a kind of a co-mingling that has to take place where a richer reality is, is, is revealed when we both honor a thing as a thing and also 
understand that that thing is it has an a temporal dimension to it, right? So d just drawing some connections there. A lot of rich threads to follow out, and I'm, you know, hoping that you know we'll be able to keep listeners' attentions with this particular level of geekiness. So sorry about that. <laughs> um, one of the things I wanted to say, just kind of framing things, because uh, Matt shared with me, you know, at the beginning before we started talking about this, and, and he also opened with that, uh, you know, Zach's concerns about going meta. I've been a fan of, since I heard it on a podcast a while back, uh, Benita Roy's thoughts on, on different ways of going meta. I see the project that I've been doing as aligned with several of the ones that she named, but maybe mostly the orthogonal one. The one that just says, okay, we've we've got these sets of assumptions, like for instance, in integral theory, we've got the, the pronouns at the center. What happens if we shift that? What happens to integral theory if we put prepositions or verbs or whatever else at the center of our thinking? And how, how does our integral thinking manifest if we begin to do that? And of course, not wanting to do that in a way that actually says, now this is the best way and we're gonna live here. <laughs> but it, it's, you know, a categorically, being willing to to move through those different perspectives and hold them again to see and and the yield of each the inactive yield of each and to work with with each of those in in, in different ways there was one what was the second question that you asked me if you, can you remember the first first or second question you asked me there because i yeah i think i think it was um just on what you thought about in terms of cystasis and sort of bringing these bringing the category uh, bringing the the spatial and the temporal together Right, and what is revealed when we when we practice that that movement between the spatial and the and the temporal, or what you thought of Gepser commenting on that? I think that was my second question. I'm not sure about my first question. <laughs> that was your third question, but now you maybe remember the second question here. So I I think, or maybe they're related. But anyway, um, one of them you were talking about just the noticing um, the different verbs and uh, you know the different things that were, were shifting in the language that he talked about you know if, if you take a explicitly a prepositional approach you know metaphysics is either is often translated as after meta being after right but you know if you look at like william desmond with his notion of metaxology meta is with you know meta actually situates you with things rather than after or above or beyond things. So that gives another twist to what metaphysics can mean. And a prepositional approach will look at actually all of the different types and modes of relationship that we might take. And we've been privileging, you know, the over and the under and, and the at or the about, um, but there are many others that we can explore. Um, the with and the through and the as, and so many different ones that that we can explore and each one of those brings us into a different felt and, and uh, experienced relationship to the world. And that gets to the sense-making piece. And so that's what I wanted to bring up is that, that was it. Um, yeah. I, I think it's really Im important. You know, I, I've been following um, Schmachtenberger's and others, you know, discussions of, of sense-making and, and Verveke's discussions of, you know, the meaning crisis. And, you know, I think it's really important, you know, that we, we, at least to some degree, go into this uh, both practically in terms of like exercises and, and, and ways of, of actually truth testing and things like that, that those are all important, especially in our fragmenting, you know, meaning ecologies right now. Also, I think metaphysically, there's still importance there to explore, you know, uh, what what is being privileged and, and, and if shifting lenses or modes of relation um, in different ways can actually help us make more sense of what's going on. Um, and I, I found, you know, that it can. Um, so I, I, I definitely think, for instance, just as an aside, but I tried to introduce some of these ideas to a bunch of uh, psychotherapists at a, a retreat a couple years ago. And especially, you know, I looked at the different lenses, but especially I focused in on the prepositional and I invited them to, you know, reflect on what was the mode of relationship that they were enacting with their clients. You know, was it a, this a straight from to? Was it a with? Was it a within where you're both together and, and internally resonating over and above? 
uh, over and, and below, you know, there are all these different kinds of, of relations that you can be enacting in any um, relational space. And that definitely will shift how the exchange happens, how meaning can be taken in, how um, your own perspective on the situation can, can be radically shifted if you really begin to play with, with, with those dynamics and to begin to look at it, you know, like what's happening in CNN, you know, debates with Don Lemon when they're, they're all, you know, all those boxes up there and they're all just basically clashing against each other and talking over each other, right? And, you know, what, what other modes of relation could we enact that, that actually bring out more of the meaning and the sense that's possible in that context, right? So I think that there's a, a practice that we can make of, of prepositional circulating and really beginning to explore phenomenologically, experientially, psychologically, what's going on as we um, hold space and communicate with others. So yeah, there's much more to, to say about that, but I practiced you know, that in some exercises and, and just introducing that to, to some psychotherapists and a number of them came up to me afterwards and remarked you know, that that really had shifted and impacted them in terms of thinking about you know, their own way of sitting together with clients and what was going on and sometimes seeing that, that they were holding space in one way and the client was holding space in another way and perceiving an entirely different relationship. So again, it's just inviting, exploring what's going on and where the disjunctions might be um, and what shift might actually bring both parties into a deeper form of relation possibly an aside here, but, you know, I, I see Raimon Panikar practicing that with his uh, different, you know, approaches to interreligious and intercultural relationships, but his whole notion of diatopical hermeneutics and topological transformation and homeomorphic equivalence, all these big words, but what he's really talking about is being able to perceive uh, the integrity of different meaning systems and being able to find points of resonance among them without reduction in either direction. Typically, you know, inclusivism, whether it's political inclusivism or, uh, or, or spiritual, where it's ours is the dominant approach, ours is the right one, and we'll include you as having a piece of the truth, but, but both ultimately I'm gonna retranslate whatever your perspective is into the terms of my own. Right, and that that's this inclusivistic approach dominates in in many spheres, and a pluralistic one becomes ungrounded because it often just basically allows all these systems to proliferate, and there's no means really of mediating among them and then we have i think some of the blooming confusion that we have right now um, in in terms of our feeling hampered to adequately sense make across a, a diverse culture right so Panikar's interest in, you know, uh, finding homeomorphic equivalence across systems, which allows for, you know, mutual resonance without reduction uh, to one or the other is, is a really important thing. As an example, you know, um, God is not Brahman and is not Allah, but each one of those terms, each one of those concepts serves a kind of function in the meaning ecology of that world space. And you can find homeomorphic functions of different signifiers across different systems and begin to form relations, but also appreciate what differences are there. And um, so anyway, that, that's a bigger topic, but I just wanted to, to mention that as, you know, something for uh, that, that's related, I think, to a prepositional approach, but also to this concern with sense making. Um, the last thing is, um, since it, I, I'm actually not familiar again with Gebser's term. So would you repeat that term and, and just tell me what that is again? Oh, it was, it was more of another footnote that uh, the description of, of bringing together, let's say, a process-oriented view and then the object-oriented object view of objects for being nouns, uh, putting them together is more fruitful and generative in terms of insight than collapsing one or the other and emphasizing one or the other. And that's it's basically what Gebser was suggesting 
um, in some of his work, uh, especially the ever-present origin, he puts forward that concept of cystasis. It's objects that are also temporal and that we shouldn't collapse one on the other but allow them to kind of commingle with each other, be with each other yeah. in a certain way. Um, it was very pre prefigurative, right? It, I don't think he was really developing a robust philosophical system along those lines, but he was suggesting that that would be in a, a, way, a way forward in a sense. Um, yeah, I definitely agree. And I, you know, I like that approach. I actually maybe see that as prophetic because I think in, you know, the speculative realist circles, especially, um, and what's grown out of that, um, I think that's a sustained inquiry right now. And one of the best examples for that, I think, is, again, um, Levi Bryant's essay, The Time of the Object, where he's basically looking at objects as each basically embodying its its own temporics. We're going to have to check out Levi Bryant, I think, after this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. He's coming up quite a bit. Um, Matt, I, I saw you un were unmuted. I don't know if you want to jump in. Yeah, I think, Bruce, you kind of were going here already and maybe already answered it, but something that was going through my head when you were talking was when we put this podcast together, we were really kind of trying to find out, at least you know, from my perspective, kind of what the meaning of integral and politics means together and how can that maybe break up the logjam of typically what you might see in, the, in America of Democrats and Republicans kind of fighting you know, with each other. And, and you know, related to sort of sense making, you know, what what can you do from a political perspective when, let's just say the ecological crisis as an example, when you maybe have one side that says this is real, this is happening, our whole entire future is at stake, and the other one's saying, well, that's kind of just bad science. Um, and, and kind of make it a two part question. And um, I also concerned about, and, and, and you kind of referred to with, with the dominator hierarchies and the growth hierarchies here, of, of some of the pushback of integralists seen as elitists. And I'm not sure if you can somehow combine that, but uh, that's my two part question. Okay, great. Yeah, it's a question I wish I had a better answer for because I think that's a really, you know, we're seeing that kind of split in, in many different quarters in our culture right now in terms of also things like the pandemic right now, where there are people and integralists who take it seriously as a real thing and thinks it needs, think it needs to be mitigated and, and worked with and that, they're, you know, um, that, that some of the steps, while maybe excessive or maybe um, inadequate, depending on the, con you know, the, situ the area and the, the context, they take it seriously as, as something. But then there's other people within the overall integral community and, of course, within our culture at large who think it's a scam, it's a farce, that there is no such thing, that it's all part of um, a, a manufactured uh, story in order to achieve nefarious political ends. And the same thing is happening with, you know, with the environmental movement and, and environmental concerns. Um, those who will, to some degree or other, take the science seriously and want to act with it, and others who see it all as cooked <laughs> and who really um, find no reason to um, to move from and act, you know, from those conclusions because those conclusions are are invalid. There's a, a deep, I think, cynicism that's kind of like split the country in multiple directions in terms of like our, our own ability to to make sense of things. And I I have no illusions that what I'm talking about here in terms of these kind of like abstract academic metaphysical inquiries are going to have much traction out in the ordinary world, right, in terms of like other people wanting to learn, you know, about about these things. Popularly, that's not going to happen. But I really think if we can use it, to me, in, in you know, maybe borrowing a little bit from spiral dynamics language without necessarily invoking spiral dynamics, but the idea of being a, a, a mesh weaver, which is a person that is able to adopt different worldview frames and to interface among worldview frames without requiring that members of those different groups agree with each other to achieve particular ends. Um, so can you find solutions to problems that don't require fundamental agreement on, on overall worldview? That's a challenge. I'm not sure you can, but I think that's one thing that we're not going to ever get one worldview to rule them all. 
right? It would be great if we could all have everybody adopt this left perspective or this integral perspective or a metamodern perspective. It's just not going to happen. So I think following Bhaskar, um, what an integral or a metamodern approach I think is better suited to do is to underlabor <laughs> for the culture rather than to impose a master frame that we expect everybody is going to adopt and go along with. Um, and so if we cultivate skills in ourselves for sense making in multiple contexts and you know communicating across different value spheres and and you know ontological metaphysical spaces, um, can we then begin to mesh weave alliances among these different perspectives without requiring necessarily any single commitment to a to an organizing system. Um, I, you know, I, I think that at least is is something that we're called to be working on right now. I don't know um, if we can do it. <laughs> um, I know that, you know, in some small ways, you know, in, in different intercultural or interreligious encounter experiments, things like that have have been achieved at a small scale in terms of just, you know, people bringing multiple people together and, and um, through various dialogical processes, looking to basically, like, like Bohm points to, being able to actually come to collective insight together that does not depend on first agreeing metaphysically or religiously with each other. Um, the only thing that really it requires is a commitment to suspend thought, is what Bohm would say. And that is, for the time being, in the interest of this communication, can we turn our thought over to the process, to the center of the group, to let it circulate and let it find new meanings and then listen back? And I think that's a basic skill that we can, we can practice and teach each other. Um, and it, you, you might still emerge from that circle and those encounters committed to quite different worldviews but I think you may have been able to make contact and find homeomorphic equivalencies and shared concerns and points of res resonance that can still possibly make room for collective action. You know, this is something we found in, in early Buddhism, which I think was interesting. And it's in contrast to what was attempted in the Abrahamic traditions mostly, which is that Buddhism centered more around orthopraxy and wasn't concerned with orthodoxy. Right, there was a an interest in in basically just cultivating a core set of skills, and then recognizing that those skills and the insights that they yield will manifest in different ways in different schools of thought and different approaches. Whereas, from you know in the West where we've inherited the Abrahamic traditions, we're always looking for, you know, that orthodoxy, and uh, I think we're not going to find it. I'm I'm a fan of the polydox. Theolo theological, you know, um, movement uh, for those reasons. Yeah, so this is not a question I had prepared, but it just came up for me spontaneously. Um, so I'm thinking about my experience as a mediator, and I remember a particular experience, and I, Bruce, I want to get your integral perspective on this. So I hit a wall. So that in my point of view, the two people I was trying to mediate with were a woman who was deeply embedded in the social justice Portland world kind of a stereotypical green uh, you know, type of uh, values and ways of looking at things. And the other guy was a 78 year old engineer who was kind of the epitome of like an orange rational atheist. And we hit a wall in that he did not understand the postmodern idea of part of, part of uh, reality or the talk about race and identity and gender and so forth is partly, is partly uh, socially constructed. It was almost like, he, he was unable to see the socially constructed part of reality and, um, or at least a socially molded or formed part of reality. And what I realized was that uh, a large part of mediation is about having people understand each other's values and moral sentiments and translating across value spheres. But as you're saying in, in this entire conversation, there are usually implicit ontological or metaphysical notions that actually engender values and morality and it's very and unless those are understood you can't have the empathy or felt experience it's like you have your values but i think your values are crazy and shit because 
I can't tune into your implicit uh, uh, background metaphysical framework that are producing the values. So I'm thinking, do you think it's possible? Do you, well, first of all, do you think there's an explicit, an explicit connection can be made between values and moral intuitions with implicit uh, metaphysical uh, ideas? And if so, do you think that tuning in as a practice, as a spiritual practice, do you think being able to tune in to the metaphysical uh, gestalts that are kind of hiding beneath the surface as a way to, you know, tune into the mind of like some Trump supporter, for example, but instead of going into that perspective from the angle of values and morality to start from metaphysics and try that lens on and then see if you can feel what they value. Does that make any sense? It does. Yeah. And to me, um, that's part of what I call onto choreography as a practice. Um, and it's something that can be done in an abstract philosophical way, you know, in a rigorous way. Um, but it's also something that I've just experimented with a few times, but I, I found it can be done on the ground experientially in dialogue groups and in process groups um, with, with a few easy prompts even to really begin to open up doors for experiencing um, how people are holding their meaning frame and their world space. Um, so I, I definitely, uh, you know, think that that's fruitful and, and, and important. I don't, you know, I, I definitely would not want to, you know, regard that as any kind of like quick fix or, or, you know, easy answer. It's not, you know, it's not easy to go there and to really let those insights sink in. But I do think there is some possibility for um, allowing some in kernel, you know, in, internal turning in your, your, your own seat of, of perception that, that can be illuminating for people. Um, and so, yeah, definitely, I, I think there's value in that. Um, I, I talk about henoontology. You know, are, are you familiar with uh, basically the, you know, henotheism in, you know, as an orientation in, in Indian philosophy or in Indian culture? Henotheism basically means that there are multiple deities but usually one is regarded as the principal deity that actually enfolds all of the others. You can look at how, you know, different, the Shaivite schools will say, you know, Vishnu and Shiva, you know, embody, you know, basically all of the traits of, of, of the other gods or deities. And then you can find where, where Krishna is, you know, embodying multiple, uh, you know, aspects of the Godhead and, and, and serving as the whole while they're still recognizing the existence of the multiple of the, of the gods, there's the one that's like the central one that, that basically enfolds them. And so for me, a heno ontology is one that basically recognizes that there's multiple ontologies that you can recognize that each one of us tend to privilege one. And in that privileging, we tend to fold the others in as aspects of that, right? So there's a kind of holographic or, you know, a fractal and holographic um, dimension to that. And so I don't think you need to get clients or people to agree to that, you know, at the outset, but I think you can begin to help them intuit that or feel that if they can find themselves in the other and they can find the other in themselves. And they're, you know, that's the thing that we have to be able to practice and do is to find each other, you know, within, within one another. That's great. That, thank you. I'm going to have to, uh, I'll do a lot of research on that and, and give you a full report on what I, what what happens with that. Um, so the next question I wanted to ask you was: so in your in your wonderful Erpie's rap song, you had a line that went something like this. You said, "So you think you're so high and woke, yeah, with your meta modern Hansi boy bloke, yeah," and then something about a toke. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm just curious, um, you know, Hansi's work and and the meta modern movement that's kind of coalesced around him seems to really be taking off. And I'm really surprised and delighted to see how many people are kind of gravitating through that thought system. What are your thoughts on Hanzi and uh, his works on metamodernism? That was definitely a, a tongue-in-cheek remark um, because I knew that many members of Erpes, uh look askance at Hanzi and metamodernism and they're very suspicious of it, uh, but I like it. Um, so I wanted to both give a nod to it and frame it within the Erpes context where I know that they're going to be suspicious of it. I think there is, uh, you know, I was a bit resistant to it in the beginning, not um, for the content of its ideas, which I liked, but for the sense of kind of blatant appropriation without acknowledgement <laughs> that I first saw in terms of like what looked to me like very much 
uh, a repackaging of many things that, that Wilbur had said in a different way with a different emphasis and more political and less spiritual and things like that. Um, I've since kind of gone into, you know, reading more metamodern material and recognize that there is actually more of an acknowledgement than I was perceiving up front. Um, and, you know, I, I think Hansi's, you know, particular packaging of it is not the only packaging of, of, of what's going under that label of metamodernism now. It's, it's a richer sphere, just like integral. You know, it's not only a Wilberian thing, right? Or, you know, there's Gebter and, and, and other, uh, you know, Arabindo and other, other ways of holding that. So um, overall, I think it's a, a really needed and important development. Um, it's a good complement to, I think, the integral movement, which has tended to be more spiritual and, uh, and less socially engaged. Um, it's not entirely that, you know, there have always been engaged aspects of integral, but the emphasis has been on the interior cultivation and looking to the internal transformation of the individual as solving everything in some way. And I think metamodernism importantly challenges that um, and really looks at the, the necessity of, of you know, social action and commitment and to begin to, to frame these types of, of insights in ways that can land on the ground um, politically and, and otherwise. I've only read parts of uh, the Listening Society, so I, I might have missed this. Um, and I I'm, I'm hope one of you can, can point out whether or not I have. have. Have any of you read the Listening Society? Yeah. yeah. Got it. Okay. So um, are any of you familiar with David Michael Levin's um, The Listening Self. Oh, no. I, I love Levin's work. Um, it's really rich and it's kind of difficult to go into, but he's got a series of books, each of which is a meditation on a different sense. There's, you know, a, a whole book meditating on the felt sense of the body. There's a book that's meditating on the eye and vision and Galassenheit. Um, and then there's a whole book meditating on the ear, on listening. That's the listening self. And there's another book meditating on the voice um, where you begin to find many of the voices of nature within the voice of, of, of humankind. Um, so they're, they're deep, beautiful, very erudite reflections um, with, uh, you, you'd call it maybe a, a a phenomenological hermeneutics. There's both an emphasis on experience and on interpretation in a way that's pretty rich. But the reason I brought it all up is that his book, The Listening Self, I think is one that could really inform what metamodernism is doing with the listening society if, you know, if it isn't already, you know, and so I, I definitely need to do my work and read more and finish the listening society book. But one of the things that um, Levin talks about that I really appreciated in The Listening Self is the recognition of, you know, the different use of our, our sense modalities, our sense-making apparatuses <laughs> for psychologically organizing ourselves and socially interacting with each other. And so I don't know how much time we have and if I'm going to go over a little bit too much with this, but basically he talks about the infant being born in this like sonorous field where the whole body is like this, this listening receptor and the whole body is just vibrating with the environment and it's undifferentiated kind of like oral field. Um, and the mother's voice is felt just like through, thrumming through the body, like, like you would feel at a concert, you know, especially in the, in the womb, you know, where you, you, you feel the music pulsing in the body. And there's this whole kind of like oral immersion in, in the thickness of, of, of the experience. And this is something that um, Lehman and uh, Jeremy touched on in their discussion for our own integral podcasters is the difference between seeing and hearing. And hearing is more immersive and, and surrounding and uh, participatory in a sense. Um, and so he says, we start out there and then we gradually, we learn to kind of like winnow down what we pay attention to and we, we, we develop a, a, an ear that's tuned to our language and to our ways of being and to our signals um, and not to others. And um, there's, it's kind of like a, you know, an unconscious kind of formation 
of the year by the culture. And at some point, there's a political turn and that we become aware of in our listening space, what is heard and what is silenced, what is privileged and what is not privileged. And there's, we really begin to learn to listen critically. We learn to, to see what are the subtexts of communications and where, where are the, you know, what are the um, consequences of different inter, you know, information flows? Um, where, where is feedback being hampered? All of these different dimensions that all have political consequences, right? In terms of like how we relate to each other, what voice carries any weight in any discourse circle, you know, all of those things. Um, and then he says that there's actually a, a, a deeper uh, turn within listening that I think, you know, connects it also to the, the, the spiritual concerns of an integral approach, which is that ultimately we never lose the echo of that early sense of being in that deep thick of relation. Um, that was the, the, that early immersive non-differentiated listening field, but that through practices that he points to like Dzogchen or Zen or things like that. And he actually went on a Dzogchen dark retreat for a while to, to, to practice experimenting with vision and, and with listening. But he, he says, ultimately, we can enact what he calls a phenomenological retrieval of going back and beginning to contact that, that deeper sense of participation in things through listening that opens us up to a fuller participation in a, you know, in a listening in the mode of what, you know, um, you know, it's like the oral equivalent of Galassenheit, where you, you allow what is there to, to come forward and present itself to you in a, in a fuller, more holistic apprehension of the thing. And so you move from that critical, reflective listening to this deeper, immersive, participatory listening as part of our, you know, political and spiritual development. And so I don't know how much that gets touched on in the listening society. Maybe it's a little bit too abstract. And, but um, to me, you know, when I, when I think about that and, and the Meta Modern Project and the Integral Projects, I see Levin's um, work as a way of, of possibly forming some, some bridges across those two different concerns um, in terms of modes of practice and, and, and ways of orienting. Yeah, he I, I don't he definitely doesn't go as in depth as you just did. He I think his listening society is more to paying attention to the needs of everyone, not leaving anyone behind. Um, but I know definitely as you were talking, um, Jeremy obviously has turned me on to Gepser and trying to get through ever present origin. A lot of of the things you were saying tied into a couple of the big themes that that I'm reading right now in, in that book. Great. No, if you want me to, to, to chime in there or not, Matt, uh, uh, that was a cue for me. But uh, uh, yeah, that's that's very interesting. I think there's a lot of correspondence with um, what you were just discussing, and a lot of the way Gebser talks about, especially the magical structure of consciousness, auditory and acoustic. And you mentioned my conversation with uh, with Lehman, uh, discussing how you know in in this electronic this time of electronic media, acoustics and the auditory sense become retrieved in, you know, and to a greater extent, perhaps more so than radio, because even in radio, the kind of long form conversations that we consume all the time now didn't really exist. They're more formulated, they're more structured, they're more edited. Um, so yeah, there is this interesting sense that the sense of hearing is retrieved somehow. Um, and I, I find it interesting as well that, that uh, the way you're describing a sort of undifferentiated kind of pliable uh, acoustic space in which the human being is completely immersed in just the, the surround sound environmental participation. And that kind of gets whittled down. A very similar processes. We see that in Wilbur. We see that in Gepser, right, in terms of development, emergence, the unfolding of consciousness. So uh, that's all I'm saying. It's just a lot of resonance there. But uh, Ryan, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I wanted to talk about a very related subject, which is herpes. Um, <laughs> I was wondering when you'd bring that up. <laughs> oh, I've been, I've been waiting. I've been chomping at the bit. Um, no, but, but I, I guess I, I have a lot of interest in the herpes uh, phenomenon after 
I interviewed you on uh, talking with TL Bruce, and then you, we kind of talked about it. And my question to you is, why do you think there's so much demand in the integral community for a place like Irby's? And my interpretation of Irby's is they're kind of an integral version of the alt-right. Not, not, I'm not using that in a pejorative sense, but in terms of being the new politics of transgression, where they feel like a lot of their opinions are being censored or are incompatible with more mainline uh, orthodox thought in the integral community, and they want a space where they can kind of vent and kind of get high off running against the grain. And, and there's kind of a trickster archetype or prankster uh, kind of a impulse at play there, which is something I can very much empathize with, that, that kind of spark of wanting to start some mischief. And, uh, and also a space where you can have discussions without being you know, worried about being called uh, or, or without worrying about the, you know, the mean green meme or whatever going after you. So that's kind of like my interpretation, but since you're, you're right in the midst of the action, I'm, I'm curious on why you think uh, there's so much interest in a place like that. And also, and, and maybe you can talk about the time when it was shut down and, and the impact that that had on the overall integral communities on Facebook. But what do you think in your ideal world, like how do you see that crowd being integrated or relating to um, people who really hate the group or to the more mainstream integral thinkers. And I know that the integral stage was part of trying to make that bridge, but I'm wondering if you could just kind of riff on that whole thing. Yeah. Interesting, you know, to go off onto that abstract metaphysical discussion and, and, and change this direction. But um, I could make a connection there in terms of valuing, holding space again for, for multiple ways of meaning making and recognizing that something can come out of that that may not be apparent on the surface. And there are risks to it. And I feel like I've directly experienced some of the risks and, and negative consequences of such an experiment, you know, so, um, and I don't know that it needed to happen this way. In terms of my own relationship to it, I was holding space for a group of people who mostly held an orientation towards the world that was not my own. You know, I didn't create Irpies to be an expression for or an exploration of my own worldview, but possibly for me to see things that were shadowed for integral community and, and for me, things that I had a hard time looking at myself. I don't know if this metaphor will really work. Uh, many, many years ago, and this might be a tangent, but I'll, I'll just see. Many, many years ago, you know, after some really difficult times in high school, um, I went through my first kind of spiritual conversion experience and became a Christian. Um, and I was mystically oriented, but I tried to find a home, you know, in, in the Christian world. And I'm not going to tell that long story, but ultimately I got burned by my experience with that. And I turned my back mostly on the Christian world for, for many years. And I had an allergy to it. Um, every now and then I would show up in Christian forums and troll them with, you know, sophomoric kinds of questions about Mary or God or the devil. Um, you know, I was young, but I, 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 that was my way of like reacting <laughs> to that. Um, but eventually at some point I recognized that I actually was not able, that this was a sore spot in me and there was a wound there and I wasn't able to hear it. And um, I made a practice of listening to fundamentalist radio um, to and from work every day for a couple years. And that sounds like it's crazy, but it took that long for me to kind of be able to hear past my reactivity to it, to find some value there again, um, to be able to find the partial truths in it, um, at least to find some love for those people on the other side of my reactivity and my woundedness to it. For me, in a way, there are, there are perspectives on, especially on, on the right that I, I can see value on both sides. There are, there are legitimate arguments left and right, you know, but there's a certain kind of personality structure that tends to show up more on the right that's really triggering to me. <laughs> so for me, in a sense, opening Irpies in one way was a way for me to like listen to that radio on the way <laughs> to and from work every day in order to kind of like, what is that meaning making happening there? What's going on? What are the core concerns? What, what's driving this? Because it, it was actually somewhat alien to me. You know, um, I, I didn't have, 
I was pretty naive to the alt-right. People warned me that, wow, there's alt-right currents showing up here and you better pay attention and, you know, things like that that I, I didn't even clue into in the beginning. I just knew that there was a kind of like a reaction against what, what people were feeling were the dominant views within integral circles and actually in, in postmodern culture. Um, I think your summary of the basic orientation of a lot of people there is really pretty good. I think that's, that's pretty close. There are a lot of people there who actually were leftists, were progressives in some ways, not all of them, but a lot of them really tried hard to be the new male, to, you know, the sensitive male, to be the, the individual who um, thought and tried to hold space for, for cultural diversity and things like that. But for, for a number of these people in whatever different context they found themselves, they found that actually they were being disadvantaged by, by those things in ways that ultimately were proving harmful to them, or at least that they started to interpret as impeding their own well-being um, in terms of the ability to find work and the ability to um, different different things. You know, you, it's a whole long discourse about you know how much affirmative action is you know impacting the abilities of whites to get positions and things like that. And so these were a group of people that I found typically had those kinds of concerns that they they said. They, they saw initially that there was value in those things and tried to follow them, but then they found that they were going far enough in a direction that they were beginning to feel taken advantage of, ignored, slighted, played down. And so they wanted a space in which they were free to explore their perspectives without being um, shunned or silenced. And the way I could justify opening and holding the group for them was that you know, at least initially, um, there was a lot of concern with while the left is, you know, and, and the kind of the progressive movement has a lot of value to it, there are some ways in which it's overstepping its bounds and actually enacting its own forms of pathology. But it's even difficult to name those things without being shut down, you know. And so, you know, that that's part of the thing that's animating the, you know, um, what is that, the intellectual <laughs> dark web, right? Yeah. So those are the kind of sets of concerns that are there. I was warned kind of like by a number of people, you know, be careful. This can magnify. It can become something that you don't even, you know, anticipate. Some of the trickster elements and some of the, the, the you know, the cheekish elements to that group were in part efforts by me to make sure that the group didn't take itself too seriously and, and, and actually turn into a space where you know some kind of like reactionary movements are born. I think I couldn't avoid that entirely. And that was like, you know, where it, it became messy and difficult for me, why I ended up shutting it down. I felt that, you know, some reactionary members of reactionary movements had moved into the group and began to dominate it in ways that um, I just I couldn't justify to myself anymore holding it open for that. And also that I was beginning to feel actually personal professional consequences from some of it. So I just thought it's just not worth that risk. So I don't know if that went any way towards answering what you wanted to ask, but. Uh, yeah, thank you, Bruce. Um, so I, I guess just to repeat the second part of my question, I mean, so I, to put it bluntly, like, like what do we do with those people basically? Like mm -hmm. I, I, I have a vision, I'm kind of an idealistic mediator and I, I'm happy to, you know, bring some people on the pot. I don't know if Matt or Jeremy would shut me down, but <laughs> you know, I'm happy to, to try to at least attempt to have a conversation. And but in terms of the larger integral space, um, what do you see as being like an ideal resolution? In the sense that I feel, in some ways, it's a little unfortunate that a lot of these views have been kind of siloed into a camp, where the, the dialogue between uh, different camps is just not happening. And I feel like integral. It, is supposed to be an expert at healing some of these divides, at least on a theoretical level. So what do you think we can do about that? And uh, do you think that, what do you think that would look like? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think a critique that I received, you know, which, which has some merit to it is that, you know, ERPIs provided a space for a consolidation around a particular orientation from which then, you know, uh, a, a renewed sense of identity <laughs> Um, around a certain set of commitments and, 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 you know, shared agreements could then be sent out to be disseminated back out into the integral field. 
um, you know, in a kind of reinforced way. That was not, you know, again, my intention. And I set up the group as a joke. I mean, I think I've explained that before. I didn't think it was going to become a forum. You know, there was a lot of lack of moderation happening on Integral Global, and there were all these kind of like fractured comments and, and conflicts. And uh, one of the reasons that it was becoming, I think, so heated and difficult is that there were expectations by people that moderation would happen and it never happened, right? Um, or it happened in a very mild way. And there was, a, you know, it, it just, there was a growing dissatisfaction going on. And one member commented, I wish there was a space that there was just no moderation, no expectation for moderation, and we could just let the group drive itself into the wall and self-destruct. And so I just created it as a visual joke playing on Wilbur's Wyatt Earpy rant and just thought, I'm going to just like create this like crazy place that is designed to self-destruct in a few days. And I did that and people started joining and I didn't think anybody was going to join. I think people were going to look at it and laugh at it as like a piece of art, but people started joining and it became its own group and it attracted its own, it, its own, it developed its own culture. I actually, I love a lot of the members there, um, you know, and I was able to, to enjoy the conversations and cutting up with them, even while not sharing a number of the political views. My idea there was on the one hand, this is not something I should say out loud because it's going to make them mad at me. Um, but one of my ideas was if I created the integral saloon, all of the people who are disrupting all the other forums would stop disrupting the other forums and they'd all have a place to hang out and enjoy with each other. And there would be some relative peace established <laughs> at Integral Global and, and IPS and other places because they could hear, do what they wanted and explore what they wanted and, and have more freedom to be. And I felt like it was kind of a service to the overall community to like give a space for that rather than having it always bumping up against uh, resistance and, 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 and fragmenting into these flame wars that never went anywhere. So that was kind of a thought is that I'm going to make a space for it. Once I saw that it was happening, I didn't intend that. But once I saw that it was happening, I thought, okay, let's just let there be a space for it and let the other groups, you know, you know, go on discussing what they want to go on discussing without having to be entertaining so many discussions of conspiracy theories or, you know, alt-rightish perspectives and things like that. What, what it looks like beyond that, I actually created the integral stage for that initially, and I haven't done it because it's too hot. I, I, I thought I would destroy the integral stage. I'd burn it down before, you know, anything happened there um, if I started right off with that. But my idea was um, just to um, make a space where some controlled, um, respectful, um, but, but needed and powerful exchanges could happen. And, you know, I think now that I know kind of your work, Ryan, some of, I think you had, you know, basically a YouTube channel kind of dedicated to that where, you know, uh, a, a crossfire type of, of, of arrangement where you could host, you know, important debates about, about issues and perspectives that were fragmenting the community and to see if some way could be found towards um, meaning making or, you know, you know, a shared meaning making and, and arriving at collective insight and possibly renewed understanding, healing some of the, the divisions. So in the long run, I still think something like that can happen on the integral stage in terms of some organized debates and discussions. And I'd like that to happen. As the integral stage started to manifest, I just, just decided I want to focus on other things right now and not dive into that hot mess because I really don't know where it's going to go and don't know how fruitful it will be. I got a bit more cautious about how much I'm hosting and entertaining those things when I, when I found, you know, that in in Erpies, a number of people who were propertarians had had moved in and were quietly influencing things. And to me, the proprietarian movement, while having some useful insights about reciprocity and things, overall and as a whole is a pernicious and destructive movement. And I just don't want to, I just don't want to entertain it. <laughs> um, as simple as that. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. I just, <laughs> when Erpies was shut down, uh, when, when you shut it down, you know, um, the first time I made a joke to the guys on the Discord group that Corey DeVos uh, secretly texted Bruce Alderman 
uh, to reopen the group to get those guys out of Integral Global. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I I I, uh, I understand um, kind of how that works. But uh, I mean, we're getting we're getting uh, to the end of our time here. But I just had one more question to ask you, and it was um, from one of your comments on the RPs before you shut it down, which was one of your complaints was that you felt like the people there weren't really coming from an integral perspective and in how they analyzed thought and communicated political and social issues. And so I'm just curious if you could give your take on your, your kind of advice to integral theorists, like how should we be thinking about some of these political, these very, especially these very controversial and divisive issues? Like how does an integralist, what kind of process, thinking process or perspective taking process does an integralist go through to, to think about these things in a way that you would have confidence saying, yeah, that seems to be an integral perspective or integral take? It's complicated because, you know, I think there are are some members in the group who, you know, don't really get integral very well or, or metamodernism or, or, you know, second tier or things like that. There are others who really are capable of that and are, you know, able to hold multiple perspectives and, and make meaning and in, in rich and you know in rich ways and multi layered ways and see you know kind of all the things that an integralist would want to check off as important and yet you know the reason I'm saying it's complicated is that you know I, I know of at least some members who would say right now while it's possible to hold perspectives in that way it's not fruitful to do so socially and that there's a conscious choice to narrow down and double down on, I would say, a, uh, you know, a narrowed set of concerns that are deliberately oppositional um, and even deliberately undermining in order to basically combat certain things that they, they think are, are going on in terms of the dominant culture. And so it's a strategic thing. It's not an inability to hold those perspectives. It's a conscious decision to double down on values that they think have been short shrifted within integral discourse and postmodern discourse and to basically reinforce them. You know, there's like a whole concern with neo-traditionalism in the sense that they, that there's a sense that, that, you know, the traditionalist, the gifts of, of traditional uh, thinking are not properly respected. The wisdom that basically has grown out of traditional ways of living over you know, thousands of years actually, are kind of being shoved too glibly to the side. And so this is my trying to give the best positive spin to that, um, what I see is that, that motivation and that orientation, is that there's a reason to double down on perspectives that seem pernicious to progressive integralists and progressives, because they feel that those things are shadow for those communities and they need to basically be shoved back in the face until there's more of a proper dialogue. Whether that's needed or, or not, or a wise strategy or not, that's what I see as what's actually happening for, I would say, the more sophisticated members of, of ERPIS. For me, I, I was you know, debating with somebody just the other day who sees the, the epidemic that's going on as a scamdemic, you know, repeating that kind of Q or, or, or Trump language, you know, um, even though this person is very sophisticated in their thinking, actually contemplatively pretty well developed, um, able to, you know, actually, I think, see in pretty deep relational and other kinds of ways, but they're deliberately focusing on mythic language, mythic dichotomies for catalytic purposes. And they rationalize it for those purposes. That, I mean, for, you know, to, for achieving those ends. For me, I think it's playing with fire, especially if there's not a kind of a stepping back and being able to hold the bigger picture occasionally. There is a value to go meta occasionally rather than just jumping into that narrow place and just like hammering, hammering, hammering until you get what you want, right? And um, I, I see that, that that's a strategy that's being adopted, that there's, they're saying that, you know, that the kind of the academic meta perspectives have proven anemic and we're getting overrun and we're, we're, we're turning, you know, into a very fragmented meaning space. And, and therefore, we need to, to center in on and focus on some very, very hard, clear 
distinctions until those things are taken seriously. That's the strategy that I see happening. For me, what I, I would say, and kind of what I push back to this individual on is, it's fine, I think, to play with that mythic language and to, to, to enact that kind of game for catalytic purposes. But it's such charged territory, you've, you've got to, at times, be able to step back and talk about, make empirical arguments and rational arguments and, and you know, epistemological ones. And, and, you know, you've got to be able to kind of like demonstrate how this is being situated so that it doesn't actually just become a reinforcement of a, a more narrow and reactionary mode, which is what it appears to be on the surface. So I, again, I don't know how clear that is since I, I'm being deliberately vague about not naming names and, and particular contents of conversations, but um, yeah. All right, well, thank you, Bruce. This has been great. Uh, where can people find you online? And uh, uh, yeah, wh where can we find you online? Twitter? email, et cetera, people want to connect with you. Um, yeah, I think uh, one of the main places I'm at right now is for the integral stage doing that work. And so that's the integral stage at gmail.com. Um, there's also an integral stage Facebook group, but there's not a lot of dialogue going on there. I just share the content there. Integral post metaphysical spirituality is a forum where I'm spending a number of, you know, hours a week uh, to dialogue and engage with people there. Maybe I'll give uh, Jeremy an, an email for reaching me personally as well, if, if you want to share that in the description. Perfect. Great. All right, Bruce, it's been an honor, and uh, we hope to have you on again sometime in the near future to talk about uh, how the integral stage is going. So thanks again. Great. Yeah, thanks all of you. I enjoyed our conversation. Yeah. Have a great week. Great. Awesome. You too. Thank you. Thanks.